Hello, welcome back everyone to another episode on Space Door Live. We're here again with the Space Roundup with our very own space experts and astronomers, Nick and Terry. Hey guys, how are you doing? So far, so good. Pretty good. Awesome, awesome. So great to have you back again for another yep. wonderful show. Um, and I can't wait for what's in store for us tonight because I know you guys haven't seen me on the screen for the past few weeks. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been here, but I'm so very excited for tonight. You've had a very, very, very good excuse, which I'll let you <laughs> tell the world about in your own time, yeah. but that's really cool. But yeah, anyway. my, my uni finally decided to have my graduation ceremony. It thought it was um, finally safe to do so, so I'm glad um, I got to kind of wear the hat and the gown um, after about a year and a half. Superb. Um, uh, brilliant. A very special day. But anyway, on to tonight's show. I'll let you guys take it away. Hope you guys enjoy it. Remember, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so. Um, this is something we started in lockdown. We're still going strong and we continue to do so um, and try to bring the space community together online. I'll let you guys take it away. Nice one. Thanks a lot. We're back. We're back. Oh. <laughs> it's been it's been a rather momentous few weeks. Um, one of our stories is going to is going to cover that. Uh, Terry's going to be talking about that with the James Webb in a little while, but we're going to kick off with our favourite topic um, <laughs> in space debris and the latest. Um, this is an interesting one. So um, as part of the defence industry, uh, this is of keen interest to myself, um, the, the group that I work with and, and the kind of work that we're doing. But this is uh, relating to the US Department of Defence. So whilst the UK government may be having lots of parties and seem to be very good at spending lots of money on things that kind of don't work uh, in IT projects over the years, the US Department of Defence, <laughs> never wanting to be uh, outdone, seem to have gone one better. Um, their JMS, a joint mission system, um, defence system for space situational awareness and, and tracking, is no more. Um, it has been finally um, kicked down the street, as it were, uh, after years of overspends and lots of issues, technical issues, etc., and various people saying it wasn't really fit for purpose. Um, so this has been a 10-year program, the JMS program, and it's cost in excess of a billion dollars. And now, just imagine that. That's just for space situa situational awareness and tracking. And it really didn't work all that well. And given that, you know, you've got things like Lockheed Martin Space Fence coming online um, relatively soon, um, you've got North, uh, Northern Space and Security with Excel Analytics currently operating, I think it's around about 400 telescopes now around the globe, tracking objects down to 10 centimetre resolution. Space Fence apparently will go down to 5 centimetre resolution, which should hopefully give us the capability to track and kind of observe potentially anywhere between 25,000 and 50,000 objects in orbit, which it sounds like a lot. And it's pretty good um, compared to, you know, what we've had over the over the past few years. But um, I was doing some kind of background research on this. And currently, um, according to UCS, there's close on 5,000 active satellites in orbit. And you think, well, if we're tracking 25 to 50,000 objects, that's pretty good. That's 5,000 active satellites. Now, out of that, 2,800 of those are operated by the United States. And you think, well, that's a lot of satellites. And, you know, the, I can see why the US Department of Defense are, are really concerned about this. And obviously, Russia are going to have their concerns as well. They'll probably have similar tracking facilities or something along these lines um, so they can keep an eye on what the Americans are doing and China likewise, et cetera, et cetera. Of those 2,800 US satellites, 2,539 of them, and this is data that's being updated all the time, so SpaceX are constantly launching new stuff, but 2,359 actually um, are commercial satellites. So of that 2,800, um, there's only about 220 of them are governmental and about about the same kind of number, 200, 250 of them are military satellites or any kind of defense purpose. Um, Russia only have currently, this really surprised me, only have 167 satellites in orbit that are active. China have 430. Um, now, altogether, this kind of totals just around about the 4,500 to 5,000 number, you know, depending on you know, when you're looking and who's come out of orbit and which have failed, etc. But then there was a meeting, Prince Charles, uh, the Prince of Wales in the UK, um, he was up at the Harwell Space Campus uh, only in the last few days. If you're watching this, it was literally yesterday, but if you're watching this live, but in the last few days, he was literally at Harwell, which is one of the big space clusters in the UK where a lot of work's being done. They've got cyclotron, they do some of the launch mission control systems come out of Harwell, which are controlling various missions. And he was there to talk about space debris. 
um, with the science minister uh, from the UK and various members of the you know, space science community. And it was a kind of meeting almost joint hosted by Astroscale, and we'll be talking about them in a minute. The, the key problem, as we keep alluding to, is that whilst we're able to track maybe 20, 30, 50,000 pieces of debris, there's upwards of 130 million pieces up there, uh, ranging from the size of a grain of sand up to the size of a school bus in, in Envisat. And um, it's a massive growing problem, exacerbated in the last few weeks by the terrifying news that North Korea, um, who are not exactly known for their diplomatic diplomacy and um, you know, friendliness with other nations, have been able to launch an intercontinental ballistic missile and take images from space. Um, the missile that they launched got up to an altitude of over 1,200 kilometers. Now, given we've had recent events with the Russians with their anti-satellite weapons test, the ASAT test, and China have done the same, and the United States have done the same, and India have done the same, and everyone's been really angry about it and really upset and given them a nasty little slap on the wrist, Given that, and given what's happening currently in Ukraine, with, again, everyone threatening to give them a slap on the wrist economically, it's really quite worrying that North Korea now have a launch capability that can put a missile directly into the path of satellites quite easily. You know, given better guidance systems, tracking, whatever, they would be able to do exactly what the Russians have done, what the Chinese have done, and what the Indians have done, and what the North Americans have done, and that is knock out a satellite in orbit. Now, for China, North Korea, sorry, for China, Russia, and the United States, that wouldn't be a good thing to do. It's already causing the Russians some problems because their ASAP test put debris under some amazing modeling videos you can look and look up on YouTube, developed by Norse and various other groups that are showing the intersection path of the debris from the Russian ASAP test and how it intersects the orbit of the ISS. And the International Space Station have already had to cancel not one, but yet multiple spacewalks as a result of the potential debris risk. With North Korea, they don't have anything in orbit. They don't care. They have no satellites up there whatsoever right now. So if they were to decide you know, and bearing in mind that Kim Jong-un isn't averse to pointing anti-aircraft weapons at his own brother-in-law um, <laughs> in an attempt to remove him. If the North Koreans decided suddenly, oh, well, the best policy for us would be potentially to knock out space capability. So a few strategically placed weapons in space. Uh, disrupting a few orbits, causing catastrophic debris cascades into specific orbits could be really, really quite dramatic, a, a dramatic a problem for the United States and the Russians. Now, obviously, they're not going to want to upset the Russians or the Chinese, but um, it's it's something we've you know, we've been kind of theorizing and postulating work for some time. On top of that, you've got the National Cyber Security Center in the UK talking about the massive increase in cyber attacks and cyber warfare and some of the reports coming out of the defense journals, Defense Daily, et cetera, talking about the threat of hacking satellites. And this is something we've talked about in the past, but it's a real threat in that a lot of the com well, onboard computational systems and ground tracking and you know capabilities for both the ground and the satellite itself aren't really that cyber resilient, especially some of the older satellites. And the ability to hack a satellite was proven um, a year or so back at the DEF CON conference when a group of Polish students, I believe they were Polish, Nick, you've just frozen there. <clears throat> Nick, we've lost you. I'm not sure if everybody can hear me. I'm going to try and contact the hosts and see what's happening. Right, uh, apparently they can hear me. I don't know what has happened to uh, Nick there. This is Nick's speciality. I'll uh, talk on a, about it a wee bit more until we see if we can get Nick back again. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know all the details of what he his background is uh, and so on with uh, 
his involvement in the uh, the space industry. But uh, there's one thing that is just worth noting. It's not totally the end of the world in terms of losing capability for space tracking because the US Air Force, who were using the JMS system, the one that has now been, uh, as I said, kicked down the road, uh, they actually opted out in 2018. They were so dissatisfied with it. It was failing to deliver. It was running over budget and basically no good for the job. They started their own new one called Space C2 for command and control, Space C2. And um, it seems to be uh, performing a lot better. Uh, the software is, as they say, a lot more agile. It's much more easy to update it. Uh, they are getting user feedback, which they can uh, feed into the, the software uh, pretty regularly. And um, I'm not sure if that applies whenever you, um, you know, outside the US Air Force, but uh, they do obviously have an alternative. Uh, it's provided by Palantir Technology, and really that's all I, I know about it. So uh, on this, Nick, oh, Nick's back. Okay. Uh, the wonders of the internet. Somebody, okay, the Nick, I was filling in. Yeah, brilliant. I don't know where people can right. hear me up to, where, where I got to, but essentially, yeah, it's a big problem. I don't know what part you, I dropped out, Terry. Any any help on that? Uh, you were talking about North Korea, and I was just waiting for a sort of an agent to come in in the back and shoot you in the back <laughs> of the head. Probably happened. <laughs> we probably got hacked. Um, yeah, North uh, Korea. As I, may, I may have been alluding to, but North Korea obviously <laughs> have nothing in orbit, and it's a major problem in that they've got missiles capable now of achieving twelve hundred kilometer orbits, and they could take out satellites quite easily in in the not too distant future. And if they were to do so, unlike say Russia or North America doing so, or China doing so, they've got so. And then the increase, you know, we're talking about, and this is probably I probably have got some North Korean agents hacking me. Um, you've got the issues with you know cybersecurity. The National Cybersecurity Agency have just put out a major threat alert saying that we need to be more resilient. So just so, um, sorry. I was just Go going on, to say, sorry. so we don't duplicate everything. I went on to talk about the new system that the USAF have introduced, the Space C2 system, yeah. which uh, certainly is replacing JMS as far as they're concerned. And I was guessing that that also might be available for uh, for the rest of the US Armed Forces and so on. But uh, I wasn't sure whether you're going to cover that or not. But just to sort of finish off on a slightly more positive note, it's not the total end of our ability to track yep. stuff in space. No, Space C2 is coming in. Don't forget, JMS also kind of had to fall back onto SPADOC, which was a NORAD control system some years ago, because it was already determined several years ago that it wasn't really fit for purpose. C2 is going to be, you know, hopefully taking over some of the uh, capabilities. We've got Lockheed Martin and Space Fence as well coming online. So it's not that it's the end of space situational tracking. There's some really good systems, as you know, hopefully. You heard me talk about Norse and their scope network. There's, there's loads of systems all around the planet that are doing this, but it's this ability to track things above five to ten centimeters, which is what we've got. But that's a, a tiny fraction of the number of pieces we need to be able to track, and that's the big problem. There's hundreds of millions of pieces up there that we just can't track, and anything above two or three millimeters across could kill an astronaut on an EVA. And my take on this is that I think we will only react and really start taking this seriously when either somebody dies or something catastrophic happens. And that will involve you know, loss of human life or loss of a major spacecraft. We shall see. Anyway, uh, sorry about the dropout. <laughs> Probably was hacked. Um, <laughs> uh, moving on to our next and hopefully uh, yep. no more drop <coughs> dropout. Hopefully less contentious. I think everybody with an interest in uh, astronomy and even in, in space generally has been following the JWST saga, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so far, as the Americans would say, everything has been nominal, which is a polite way of saying everything has gone perfectly. It is just almost too good to be true. It has now gone to its final destination, the L2, the Lagrange 2 point, which is almost a million miles out from the Earth on the opposite side from the Sun. Now, it's not actually going to be stationary there. A lot of people think that it will go out and just sit there uh, 
more or less stationary in space, except that the L2 point moves as the Earth goes around the sun, uh, obviously. But it actually enters a little orbit around the L2 point. And this gets a bit complicated, so I'll not go into that in any more detail. But basically, it stays within the L2 zone where it is stable. And from there, it will, over the course of a year, be able to observe the whole sky. It cannot point anywhere near the sun. It cannot even tilt so that any part of the telescope is not hidden behind that famous sun shield from the sun. But as it moves around uh, the sun in the course of a year, it obviously covers 360 uh, degrees of the sky. Now, you're not going to see any pretty pictures for quite a while. There's an incredible amount still to be done there. Those 18 mirrors, which have to be each aligned to nanometers, basically. Uh, not only each one perfectly pointing at the secondary mirror, which you see up there above the main mirror, but each one exactly aligned with each other and exactly level with each other. If you were to scale up the surface of that mirror, to the size of the United States, there could not be, if it's working perfectly, any deviation from a flat surface, or sorry, a curved parabolic surface, but an ideal surface of more than a, a couple of millimeters. It really has to be that accurate. And then there are all the instruments, each of which has to be uh, commissioned and tested and aligned and so on. So it's going to be three, four months probably before we see uh, any results coming from it. Also, it's still cooling down. Uh, it has to reach incredibly low temperatures. I think already it's down to about minus 200 or so on the uh, the shadowed side of the sun shield. Some of the instruments need to get a lot cooler than that. And one of them, the Miri instrument, actually needs to be cooled down to about four degrees above absolute zero. That's minus 269 degrees uh, Celsius that we're used to. So there's a lot still to be done. But one thing that um, amateur astronomers might be interested in is to have a look at the star that it will use for testing and aligning and calibrating its op uh, optics. And that's a star in Ursa Major called HD. 84406. In other words, it's from the Henry Draper catalogue, 84406. It uh, would be quite easy to find, although it's too faint to be seen with the naked eye. You see it with binoculars. If you take the bowl of the plough, or uh, sorry, the bowl of the Big Dipper, or the ploughshare of the plough, the two stars across the bowl, if you like, and continue that low line outwards from the rest of the plough for approximately the same length again the two stars at, at the top of that bowl, you'd come to where that star is. You really do need software to be able to find it. It's about seventh magnitude. And what they say is that initially they'll get 18 different images of that star and they'll be out of focus. So what they need to do is to get all those images perfectly aligned with each other and perfectly in focus. And then they start to uh, do proper science. So it, it really is, it's almost tempting fate to say it, but everything has gone just absolutely perfectly so far. And there have been so many incredibly difficult maneuvers that have had to be done in sequence and nothing so far has gone wrong. All the difficult bits have been done. So we await the science with, fun, with great interest, uh, what it will reveal about the rest of the universe and indeed the outer parts of our own solar system. Everything in between is just absolutely mind bending or mind bending. Uh, one other good bit of good news, the high gain antenna uh, has been turned on. Uh, it has to be on the sunward side of the, uh, the mirror of the instrument of the sun shield because it itself will give out heat as it operates. So, and it obviously points back towards the earth, which is in the same direction as the sun. So it will be sending back data and uh, used for communication with the spacecraft. And um, the, the good news is that that's switched on and working. So there's a lot more still to do, but so far all on schedule, all working well. And we'll obviously keep you updated with them. Um, with all the developments. We talked earlier about all the science that it will do. And as each instrument comes on stream, we'll probably say a bit more about that in the future. So I'm, next, I'm sure you're excited as I am. Yeah, and the fact that they've been firing up the instruments in the last few days, um, and some of these have been in kind of like a, a cryostasis, as it were, for some years now. Um, the instruments like Miri, for example, the completion on the testing on those was some years ago. So to get 
where they are and the precision of the orbital insertion and then the instruments firing up. And as you said, there's lots of calibration still to do. Um, it, it is remarkable. The other thing with the antenna is the data rates coming from this. Yeah. Don't forget, with the Hubble, you're only at a 450 to 500 kilometer orbit um, above the Earth. Obviously, in you know the good old days, we used to send the astronauts to service out parts of the Hubble and replace cameras, etc. With this, we can't. Um, but at these kind of distances, to get the data rates that they're getting as well is really, really impressive. So, I mean, it's it's just a beautiful piece of work, the whole thing. And yeah, hopefully, first light is going to deliver you know stunning science as well as uh, you know over the coming years and hopefully we're looking at a 10 plus year nominal lifespan at least for this thing um yeah. some of the images and some of the science we just hope is going to be incredible and as well looking at some of the proposals that are going in for the science and obviously we're going to be talking about some of the um Recent discoveries, one of the interesting recent discoveries uh, that's been made by ground-based observations and by um, current orbiting telescopes, um, things like that that will need follow on with the James Webb are going to be so important because this, there's a lot of things that have been kind of tantalizingly glimpsed at that telescopes like the James Webb hopefully will give us a lot more data on. So it is one of those uh, remarkable things that we just hope is going to keep on giving. Yeah, it's going to be sending down 29 gigabytes of data twice a day. Yeah. So it's just amazing. It and really is. Th th there's more to come from other telescopes too. <laughs> you know, the, the actual data acquisition and storage and analysis is one of the major issues in astronomy at the moment. There's just so much coming in. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with the SKA we're talking about. Is it 1.1 zettabytes of data yeah. per day when that's yeah. fully operational? So, yeah, it's a, it's a biggie. Anyway, moving on, uh, we'll quickly touch on this one. This is uh, Astroscale. So the same before um, the slight interruption that we had, um, Prince Charles and Prince of Wales visited Harwell, and one of the companies that he went to visit was Astroscale. And Astroscale, a kind of joint UK-Japanese um kind of mission proposal company team that are looking at orbital debris removal. So they have launched a mission called LCD, uh, which is this kind of eventually fully autonomous small debris removal system. So you've got a main primary satellite and this kind of small debris test article that in August last separated just for a few centimetres um, to do a demonstration using ground-based manual control to kind of show that they could map and recapture a small piece of debris in orbit. More recently, what they've tried to do is create this 17 kilogram test article to tens of meters away. So if you look at some of the videos that Astra Scala put out, they're really interesting how they're doing this. They're doing a mapping kind of orbit around an object. So the idea is that the, the spacecraft will approach a piece of debris um, and circle around it. Because obviously when you're looking at debris from the ground, you may not know if it's spinning, it could be tumbling, there could be smaller pieces of debris floating around it. You don't, You really don't know. So the idea is that they're going to map it in you know, multiple dimensions and then almost autonomously, I mean, the, the, the eventual aim is to do this completely autonomously, um, then go up to the piece of debris, grab it, and then deorbit it. Now, it's a, it's a fantastic achievement, you know, what they've already done. This week, however, they had a slight anomaly with their autonomous systems, and they've had to kind of stand down and work what they're doing with this. Now, the command and control on this is based at uh, the kind of mission control centre for this out of Harwell and Oxfordshire in the UK. The interesting thing from my perspective with what they're doing compared to some of the other uh, alternatives with harpoons and nets, etc., is kind of scaled up a bit. They could send up almost like multiple grapple systems it's a, it's based upon electromagnets, um, and they could in effect, using one mission, if they have enough you know, propulsion capability, etc., go not just to one satellite to deorbit it or one piece of space jump to deorbit it, but multiple, um, hopefully in the future. This is the way forward. You can't just have a one-for-one -one mission. So especially if you look in this case, they've had an anomaly. Now, what that anomaly is, um, obviously, they're keeping quite tight lips, obviously, software issues, etc., but we are aware that not just on this mission but other missions there are already disruptive cyber not cyber attacks but disruptive issues being caused by rogue nation states who may be trying to interrupt some of these missions and you know, not just talking about astro scale here but we're talking about lots and lots of you know other missions that are planned and in proposal and actually flying so i'm hoping that 
the larger companies look at this and hopefully look at the success of what AstraZeneca are doing and look at their model and what they're trying to achieve and don't just go for the one up one down approach where you send up a satellite if that goes wrong you're just adding to the space junk problem if you send up a one-to-one -one mission and something fails you've achieved nothing mm -hmm. even if you send up a one-to-one -one and you and you de you know deal with both of them you're only pulling out one piece to the brain and as we were saying before there's hundreds of thousands of them, and some of them you know even if you've got the best electromagnetic magnetic systems in the world they're not magnetic you can use diamagnetism you know if you wanted to kind of move non-ferrous objects but it's not optimal there aren't any optimal ways of doing this so hopefully what astra scale if they get back online and they really show this will scale up i I still have my doubts. Um, I've got a lot of admiration for what Astra Scale are doing, but I really do have some of my doubts. Um, it's one for one missions. I don't know what you think, Terry. Yeah. Uh, just for information, Alpha Elsa is actually saying more or less what it does on the 10. Uh, it's for end of life services by Astra Scale, and yeah. the day is for demonstration. So that this was their demonstration that they could do it or not. So basically, it's saying that when a satellite reaches the end of its life, uh, instead of Pressing around up there, out of control, in danger of colliding with something else and starting a Kessler syndrome, they will be able to grab it and deorbit it. Um, it'll be a slow process, but if they deal with all the big stuff, the the dead satellites, which uh, if they hit another reasonable sized satellite, would start a, a Kessler syndrome cascade. Um, they'd not be able to deal with the wee things the size of a you know a, a golf ball. Uh, which can do a huge amount of damage if they hit the ISS or, or wipe out a, any other satellite. But yeah. to get the big bits out of the way, that will certainly be a good start. Oh, yeah, it's it's a really admirable team, definitely. Anyway, so that was just a little kind of brief segue. Um, moving on to our next, this is a random of this story. Yep, All this is another story. one of mine. Uh we have a pretty interesting solar system ourselves from hot and airless little Mercury, baking hot on one side, freezing cold on the other, out to our beautiful planet Earth uh, via Venus, which is basically a, a, a hellish twin of Earth, Mars, which we talk about an awful lot and we will talk about shortly, then out to the huge giants of Jupiter and Saturn, and a bit further out to the ice giants of Uranus and Neptune. Huge amount of variety. And if you didn't know, you would think, well, other solar systems out there might be something like that. What we're finding out is the most unbelievable extremes of other planetary systems. And uh, there's one, and actually we're going to feature one, but I'm going to mention another one at the end. This is one of the most extreme exoplanets yet. It's called WASP-189b because it was the wide angle search for planets, number 189 and B is the, the planet going around it, or the, the innermost planet going around it, about 322 light years away. Now, it is 20 times closer to its star than the Earth is to the sun. And it has an unbelievable temperature on the daytime side of 3,200 degrees centigrade. Not going to give it in Fahrenheit, although the Americans like that. It was discovered by the CHEOPS satellite. The great acronyms here. CHEOPS is for characterizing exoplanets, uh, satellites, and uh, search for, sorry, Yes, characterizing exoplanet satellites. There's a few extra letters in there that are taken from the middle of the word, which is a NASA satellite. And uh, it's finding some real humdingers of planets. This planet is so hot that the atmosphere is basically of, of metals of various sorts. It has so far been detected that there's a gaseous iron, chromium, magnesium, manganese, and vanadium, all of which have very high melting points. In fact, on Earth, you'd be hard pressed to actually melt any of those metals without a very specialized furnace. In this case, the, the uh, temperature on that side, the sunward side of the, the planet, or the starward side of the planet, is so hot that they're not just molten, they're vaporized. So you have gaseous forms of those metals, and they are, as far as they can tell, they exist in layers. So if you could build a spacecraft uh, capable of resisting of those temperatures, you would descend through layers of those different gases, uh, of, of those metals. It's almost mind-boggling 
what, what this is uh, doing. So uh, whatever you think in terms of uh, mercury being inhospitable because it's so blisteringly hot on one side and freezing on the other, or the ice giants like Uranus and Neptune incredibly cold, you ain't seen nothing yet until you start looking at other um, other exoplanets. I'll just mention the one other one. Uh, sorry, there's another one, titanium oxide. I forgot to uh, mention it. And titanium is such a high melting point that it's actually used uh, specifically in very high temperature applications. But another one also discovered by WASP is WASP 103b, 35 light years away in Hercules. And it is so close to its star that it goes round it in less than one day. So its year is less than one terrestrial day. Uh, and what's even more amazing, not when you think about it, it is so close to the star that it is actually elongated. It's drawn out into the shape of a rugby ball. Now, it's not solid as far as we know, it's mainly gases, but that is the apparent shape of this planet because of the, the stretching of the gravitational pull of the star that it's orbiting so close to. And no doubt there are others at the other extreme, uh, but they're, they're much more difficult to, uh, to find because they'd be so far out that the very, very long orbits and the chances of them passing across the face of the stars so we can see the light dip are remote and they're too far right to cause uh, a spectral shift. But there's, I'd be very, very surprised if there aren't even more extreme examples of huge planets even further right than uh, Uranus and Neptune in our solar system. And we're only just scratching the surface. We've only discovered 5,000 of these so far. But the, the general consensus is that almost every star has or has had a planetary system. So there are going to be some real humdiggers out there, even sort of a uh, uh, putting to, to shame or, or totally eclipsing what we've found so far. But these actual planets just never cease to amaze me. I'm sure you agree, Nick. I do. It's it's also interesting you talk about the, the WASP discovery. If the listeners don't know, WASP is a relatively small telescope. The WASP system yeah. was conceived some years ago. And it's, it's nothing more than a, a large bunch of almost amateur-sized telescopes. They're not massive telescopes. They're small refractors in a kind of clustered array with almost common off-the-shelf CCD sensors as well. It's a brilliantly conceived system that's been scanning the sky for quite some time now and discovering hundreds of these exoplanets. I've still got several issues with the proximity of some of these so-called exoplanets discoveries as you said the orbital discs are minuscule in many respects and if you've got a surface temperature on a planet which is almost you know two-thirds out of the surface temperature of our own sun um it kind of beggars it almost beggars belief you think these hot jupiters these you know super close proximity planets but then you look back at some of the theories of the earliest formation period of our own solar system and Jupiter appeared as root through the inner solar system before stabilizing out in its current orbit, however many billion years ago. Um, it, it just, it really does beg a belief. Um, the fact that you've got stretching as well, it's almost like the tidal forces that are going on with Jupiter's moons and you look at what's mm -hmm. happening with Io with this kind of in style effect with Io so um, again this is one that I think telescopes like the JWST with its massively increased resolution over and above you know, even what the Hubble or any of the large ground based telescopes can do should hopefully shed more light on this and get some really detailed spectroscopy and very detailed images potentially as well not only inferring that these objects are real because at the moment we're just looking as you said at light curves and then inferring the distance to the planet and the mass of the planet based upon the physics that comes out of the light curve calculations. But being able to do direct observations of exoplanetary systems way over and above what we've we've had from the Hubble so far, I think it'd be amazing to see. Um, yeah. The thing about WASP, uh, one of the fascinating things is that they're basically big, powerful telephoto lenses yeah, yeah. with very sensitive uh, um, detectors on the back and, as you say, arranged in an array. But I think they were Canon lenses. I'm, I'm fairly sure they were Canon, but Canon, yeah, had just... stopped, yeah, Canon had stopped making them. So they were buying these lenses on eBay or wherever they could get yeah. them. You know, it, it was a shoestring operation, but, as you say, extremely successful. WASP is simply it's, standing it's for like wide angle search for planets but it's brilliant yeah. been very effective 
It's amazing if you're used to watching Go football ahead. matches. Yeah, if you're used to watching football matches, the kind of the small refracting telescopes that many amateurs have. You look at some of the sports photographers that are on the side of the pitch in football matches. That's what they're talking about here in terms yeah. of the lens capability. It's it's yeah, it is amazing. Anyway, moving on before I lose my Wi-Fi, I've worked out what the problem was. My <laughs> Ethernet has decided it's just not going to play ball tonight. So we're hanging by a thread on, on Wi-Fi. It's not that the North Koreans are hacking me. Um, Perseverance. Uh, we haven't been hearing much out of Perseverance of late. I mean, they've been you know doing some great science. The landing obviously was stunning uh, and staggering. But Perseverance is there. You know, one of its primary goals is sample collection. So ahead of ExoMars, which is the European Space Agency mission due to launch and land in a few years' time, and then a sample recovery and sample retrieval mission where there'll be a smaller craft in Mars orbit and then to the Earth and obviously hopefully then delivering the first ever pristine samples from the surface of Mars. We've got loads of Martian meteorites um, which have arrived on Earth. There was a really interesting story about the follow-on from Allen Hills 84001, if, which if you remember some time ago during the Clinton administration in the United States was announced to be potentially life-bearing. They, they thought they found microscopic organisms. It turns out that it wasn't that there are non-biological processes that can produce those structures that were seen in the Allen Hills meteorite. So being able to take direct core samples and drills using Perseverance, collect them and put them in the tubes is amazing. But it, whilst it's, you know, if you've ever handled lunar regolith or small, small meteorites, and tried to put them into a rotating carousel. Have you ever played with one of them in the, in the 1970s, Terry and I were probably little cap guns? Yeah. You're putting things in and things can get stuck and jammed. And that's exactly what happened to Severance. So some of the pebbles basically got jammed in the carousel. Now, the way that they got around this is really quite intriguing in that obviously you've got a multi-wheel independent wheeled system on Perseverance. And what they did was they backed up uh, and lifted, <laughs> lifted the entire kind of rover up a little bit and then jiggled the, the carousel around. They called it the shake, rattle and roll maneuver um, or uh, the shake it off, the Taylor Swift maneuver. They basically managed to free up the carousel, dislodge the pebbles and they're now back in operation. And it reminded me, the a kind of little segue story here. So I was over in California when they were commissioning uh, an instrument on the Panama telescope, 200-inch Panama telescope. And I was over there with a team from Oxford University, uh, and I was covering it actually for a, a magazine that I was writing for at the time. Um, and it was amazing being up at the Panama uh, Observatory, etc. But then after the kind of three or four nights we had observing run up on Palomar, the Athenaeum, um, which is near to Caltech and had meetings at Caltech. And I got chatting to a guy at the bar at the Athenaeum and it turned out um, he was the rover driver for Spirit and Opportunity is one of the rover drivers. And they were trying to work out at the time, um, you know, what obviously um, got stuck in a sand trap and they were trying to work out how to dislodge it. And this is still an issue to this day. And even these autonomous rovers with their vastly more capable computational uh, abilities, they've still got this problem that, you know, if something goes wrong, you're hundreds of, it tens to hundreds of millions of miles away. And you've got to kind of solve it in really, really ingenious ways. Uh, you know, even with the best autonomy, the best com you know, computational systems, the, the best testing that you could you possibly imagine, and it goes again back to the James Webb. It's like, how do you fix these things? And you can't. And the argument again came out, and there was an interesting kind of discussion between a quite famous science writer, uh, Marcus Chown, and an economist, talking about the benefits or not of space travel and human space flight. And I remember um, Professor Sir Martin Rees, who's the Astronomer Royal in the UK, discussing kind of the pros and cons of this and saying that the Apollo space program, for, space program, for example, shouldn't have ever happened. It's like, well, unless you put boots on the ground and put human beings there, these kind of problems, you know, are, are going to continue to creep up even on the best robotic systems. You know, they can still go wrong. Whereas, yes, a human, you can have human failures and the cost of putting humans on, on other planets is, is staggering compared to robotic missions. But I don't think anything beats putting, putting humans there. And you only have to look at, again, going back to Apollo, how many hundred, you know, tens, hundreds of kilograms of lunar rocks were brought back. And yet we're excited now about bringing back a few tens of grams, maybe by 2030 from Mars with, with perseverance and the follow-on missions. I don't know what your thoughts are, Terry, but 
Yeah, I, I, I quite agree. I mean, it, there is a, a huge cost and a huge risk. But if people hadn't taken the risks, for example, at the dawn of, of the uh, uh, manned flight, we wouldn't now be able to fly from here to America. Uh, the casualty rates in the early days of, of uh, flying were, were far higher than they've been in the space program. But we do have that urge to go and, and explore. And as you say, nothing beats a human being uh, there to make decisions to fix something on the ground, whether it's a piece of tape or hitting it a kick with a, your boot or hitting it with a hammer or whatever. Uh, you know, it, it, it took them uh, quite a few days. I forget the exact length of time, maybe a week to actually yeah. solve this problem. They tried sort of uh, banging the thing against the side of the rover. They tried turning it upside down. Some bits came out, but then there were these last few bits that uh, that were clogging it. So apparently, according to the, what I've read, they call it the twist maneuver. They yeah. got one of the wheels up on a, on a rock and then they shook the whole, the whole rover backwards and forwards and that did the trick. But if you'd had an astronaut there, he or she got a dust fixed, brush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and fixed it like that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there's pros and cons. Eventually, you need to get people there. Exactly. You look at yeah. Apollo 17 with Gene Turn and, and Harrison Schmidt, and basically the use of duct tape. And duct tape it seems to be the the fix all for everything. But with the fender yeah. on the on the rover, yeah. and it's okay. Well, let's tear a page out of the um, EVA book and stick it on, and and away we go. Um, so it's that the Cost time implications, as you said, you know, almost a week, you know, when Spirit and Opportunity, you know, the issues that they had and the months that they spent trying to resolve those. Whereas, yeah. with, you know, you've got to weigh those up. So I'm always a big fan of, yeah, if humans are willing to take the risk and a lot of these incredibly brave astronauts are, send them. Um, you know, we're going to go to Mars at some point. Um, it's it's whether or not we need to do it now um, on mass, or we should just send science there. But anyway, it's a really good story, and again, a, a good happy one. Um, moving on to uh, yep. staying with Mars, actually staying <laughs> with Mars. Interesting story on Mars. Yeah, our our favourite planet apart from our own, obviously. Um, we talked a while ago about uh, finding um, from radar measurements that there was probably liquid water under the surface of the poles of Mars, which would be fantastic. But science isn't just always that simple. Uh, you can get one sort of uh, results and interpret one particular way, and it seems very plausible. Then somebody else comes along with some other measurements or another theory, and suddenly you're you're sort of not quite so sure of what you had come up with. Classic example of that was the the possibility of life in the atmosphere of Venus, still slightly open, but uh, it, it certainly doesn't now seem that that was uh, uh, a genuine finding, although it was very uh, much promoted at the time. But on Mars, back again, we do know that there's ice on the surface. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, you can even see it in your own telescope, the way it develops in the Martian winter at the North Pole and the South Pole alternately with the Martian seasons. But there was this finding from the reflection of a particular uh, way the radar echo came back that there was liquid water under the surface uh, near the uh, South Pole of Mars. And, um, you know, that sounded fantastic. Uh, water is essential for any sort of a, a long term stay on Mars for not only for humans, but uh, for uh, breaking down the water and the oxygen, you use the oxygen um, for fuel with, it, with other things and so on. Basically, you, you can't have a base uh, on any other part of the solar system on the issue of water. So this was a major finding. But now there's been some more uh, research done, some more simulation of what might have actually caused this effect. And they think now that it's actually a lava plain under the surface near the poles of Mars. And what they did basically was a simulation of covering the whole of the surface of Mars with a simulated ice sheet and looking at how the radar reflection would uh, tie in with the surface geology that we know exists on the visible surface of Mars. And they find out that you got the same sort of reflection as they had interpreted as water, where you had a relatively smooth lava plain. So that would be an alternative explanation. The other thing which argues against there uh, being liquid water under the poles of Mars is that it would have to be incredibly salty 
for it to be liquid. If it wasn't very, very salty, it would be frozen. It would be ice. And you would also need a heat source relatively nearby to keep it liquid. And from what we know of the subsurface geology of Mars, uh, that's not very likely. So it now seems that unfortunately, that uh, idea that there was uh, liquid water below the South Pole of Mars. It's not totally uh, disproved yet, but it doesn't seem quite so likely. But there is nevertheless uh, no doubt whatsoever that there is water on the surface. Uh, it comes and goes with the seasons. And as you can see in that photograph there, there's actually a, a sort of a frozen lake of, uh, of water ice on the surface of Mars. And we also know, which is the really fascinating thing when we look at the geological features on the surface of Mars, the erosion features, that there has been liquid water on the surface of Mars. Perhaps an ocean uh, about as big as the Mediterranean uh, in the past the uh, interesting question is, did life form when that water was there? And if so, has any of it survived below the surface? Or is there any fossil evidence of any of that life? So uh, bad news, but that's the way science works. You, you have to take the, uh, the good news and the bad news. And if it turns out that there's no liquid water under the surface, that's the way it, uh, science progresses. We, we go on and we uh, discover something else or come up with another theory. It's interesting though as well that the, the two sets of research basically coming to different conclusions and it's very, it reminds me a lot of the kind of methane discussions. I remember having discussions with some of the um, you know the teams who are working on some of the orbital cameras uh, when the initial findings from the Canada France Hawaii telescope and then the European Mars Express um, orbiting observatory you know, were picking up methane on the surface of Mars and there was still real doubt over this because the rovers obviously on the surface weren't detecting any initially and then it's in the very low parts per billion in, in many respects. Something's still creating this methane, it's now almost definite that there is methane production on Mars that is seasonal, that's coming out of certain hot spots on the, on the planet's surface that we can't account for what's causing it. It could be biological, it could be, it could be a, a biological, it could be, it could be microbe subsurface, it could be a geological process. We don't know. But it, you know, with the water, the whole brine, we, we don't understand. And until we start sending people there, you know, even with the rovers, the capability of the rovers and the subsurface geology that they can do and the drill, you know, drilling down a few meters, that's fine. But we need to do proper exploration it's like going back to the moon we still have you know lots of theories on how the moon formed and we're pretty sure of how the moon formed but until we really establish a firm scientific foothold on the moon and then on to mars there's going to be still so much she said terry if you know one of the rovers were to pick up uh, a rock looking at it with the microscope and detect something that looked like a fossil until we get there there's always going to be that mm -hmm. element of doubt i would imagine in terms of, or we get a sample return and we can absolutely conclusively prove in a laboratory, in you know laboratory conditions. But then you'd have people saying about cross contamination and you know, all sorts, and you know the same with the methane production. If, if you know microbes are found, okay, well, have they been there all the time? Is it something that humanity's placed there with previous spacecraft? We don't know. You know, we planetary protection is one thing, but something always gets through, as it were. So. Uh, yeah, it is really interesting. I was reading the research on this, and it is a kind of one side says this, another side says the other. But the scientific method, that's the beauty of it. So mm -hmm. It will come to a logical conclusion and will come to hopefully scientific fact at some point. So, um, I just, yeah, wonderful. Sorry. Yeah, the very, very latest now is another theory that it could be a uh, similar radar reflection you would get from a kind of clay whenever uh, water actually erodes rock. Uh, yeah. I don't have any more details than that. So that's two possible alternative explanations rather than the water. But as you say, it remains to be seen until we actually go there and uh, get a drill right down into it. We'll not know for certain. Absolutely. So moving on to our last story, and this one's a little bit sad, but not so, yeah. So SSC uh, Piers Sellers. So Piers Sellers, um, I had great fortune of meeting um, some years ago when I was over at Goddard, very briefly. Uh, a friend of mine 
uh, spent a lot more time in, in Piers' company, and apparently he was a wonderful, wonderful uh, human being. Uh, so Piers Sellers is, was a Brit, uh, British kind of scientist who joined NASA in the early 1980s, uh, and then eventually he kind of had to become a US citizen because in those days, if you wanted to kind of become an astronaut with the astronaut corps in NASA, you had to change your nationality. So became a US citizen, joined the astronaut corps in the mid-90s, um, flew on multiple missions up to the ISS, helped build the ISS, uh, and went on multiple EVAs, spacewalks, etc. Kind of remarkable, but also very passionate climate scientist. Mm-hmm. And he did an awful lot in terms of, you know, promoting climate science way before, you know, in the last few years, it's become extremely, you know, fashionable and, and kind of trendy to, to really push climate science. And there's been so many wonderful advocates of that. But Piers was doing this for years and sadly um, died a few years ago, uh, quite young, only 61, of pancreatic cancer, one of the most severe and aggressive forms of cancer. Um, so it's really amazing that Northrop Grumman, one of the big defence companies, and their kind of resupply missions with the Cygnus, they've named the capsule after him. And this kind of goes from a tradition of, you know, a lot of capsules and missions of late have been named after astronaut heroes of the past. Like, obviously, we've got New Shepard and we've got New Glenn from, you know, Blue Origin, etc. cetera. Um, we've obviously legacies to Alan Shepard and John Glenn and, and the fantastic missions on the Mercury and Gemini and through to Apollo even with Alan Shepard. And in the past, the European Space Agency with their ATVs, they've named them after famous historical scientific figures. They've had, you know, the Einstein mission, etc. cetera. Um, but this, I think, is a wonderful... Uh, kind of recognition of a, a truly great scientist and his world you know he became quite a senior figure at Goddard Space Flight Center um, and I just think this is wonderful that hopefully it's a tradition that will continue uh, as we get more you know as I say continue it, it's almost sad to think that we're losing so many of our heroes but giving them the recognition that they deserve especially the ones that may not be as familiar public you know if you were to name a, a supply vessel the ss buzz aldrin you know god forbid when when buzz passes away um everybody will know him but there's so many people who helped in apollo the mission control teams etc and obviously they named you know mission control center christopher after christopher craft etc even during his lifetime i think this is a great tradition that nasa are kind of um upholding and flag waving for and long may it continue um i don't know what your thoughts are terry but... yeah yeah he was uh, he was actually uh, the director of our sciences at nasa yeah. goddard space center which is pretty high up uh, i had the honor of meeting him actually at uh, the party that the bbc threw on for the um, the 50th anniversary of the scat night he was the guest of honor there and as you say a, a really delightful guy so very sad but it's appropriate and i think the fact that he was a climate scientist uh, is a reflection of now just how seriously people are taking uh, the climate change issue. Um, so I, I thoroughly approve of, of that. Uh, a great man and uh, a, a fitting tribute for him. Yep. Yeah, wonderful. Right, moving on to what's up in the sky, and let's let's look yep. up at the sky. Um, <coughs> we've got lots of ISS passes going, Terry. What else have we got to look forward yep. to? It's yeah, it's coming near the end of, of this series of evening passes, another five days or so visible in the evenings. Just heard today that NASA now plans actually to bring the ISS back down to Earth, crash it into the Pacific in January of 2031. So uh, you have less than a decade to go. We have plenty of observation, plenty of news from it between now and then. But uh, actually, there was some doubt about whether they would fund it for even more than the next couple of years. But now that's uh, just today's new news. They're going to continue funding it and operating it up to January 2031. So something that we don't often t- talk about is the sun, our own nearest star. And it has just come out from a, a fairly deep and long solar minimum. It goes through an 11 year cycle of visible activity in terms of sunspots and flares and so on on the surface. Uh, It's coming out from what was a particularly long and deep minimum. And people were uh, suggesting that the next maximum would actually be a very feeble maximum. In other words, it wouldn't build up to the usual high level of activity. But the latest information is that it's actually ahead of the curve, as they say. Uh, It has wrapped up the uh, level of activity slightly higher than the predictions. And there are actually three quite large sunspots visible on the surface at the moment. Now, before I go any further, a word of warning. You do not ever, ever 
look at the sun through any sort of an optical instrument, not even through a viewfinder. Uh, it will seriously damage your eyes. And as I always say, if you uh, are using binoculars, you'll wipe out both eyes at once. You just don't do it. If you're in any doubt whatsoever, you have to use the internet or ask your local astronomy club or somebody that knows what they're doing in order to observe the sun safely. The safest way of all is simply to project the image through a telescope onto a piece of white paper and look at the image that way. But even with that, there are slight hazards. So don't do this unless you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, it's relatively simple and you can actually see the sunspots on the surface. So as I say, there are three big ones at the moment. Um, they're not directly related and they don't always produce an aurora, but basically every time there's a big sunspot uh, on the surface of the sun directed towards us, there's a chance that we'll get a nice display of the aurora over uh, the next uh, evening or two. Uh, there was a little bit of activity from the one that was, uh, was biggest, number 2936 in the numbering series. Nothing terribly spectacular, but we are looking forward to uh, more activity. So as I say, the latest forecast is that there actually could be a higher than average maximum uh, at, at the end of this cycle in 2025. So as I say, always be careful check on the internet or check with somebody that knows what they're doing. If you do that, then you can observe the sun safely. And I'm sure you'll echo that, Nick. The other thing that we, sorry, absolutely, absolutely. just to get this done. Yeah. Uh, in the morning sky, there are lots of early risers. I'm not one of them. But if you look at the, uh, in the morning sky and the morning twilight, you see brilliant Venus, the brightest star-like object in the sky. We said goodbye to it in the evenings there a couple of weeks ago. It has now passed behind the sun as appearing on the other side. And we now see it in the mornings. And you can use it to find Venus and Mars at the moment. Or sorry, Mercury and Mars at the moment. Venus is much, much brighter than any other star-like object in the sky. It's the second brightest thing after the moon in the night sky. And at the moment is forming a nice triangle with Mercury to its lower left, considerably fainter, but still visible in the twilight, and Mars to the lower right. You may well need binoculars to see them in the twilight because the sky is a bit bright. And now for the next couple of days, four or five days, Mercury will gradually be getting brighter, but it will also be dropping lower into the twilight. But Venus is so brilliant that you cannot fail to see it in the morning twilight. So go whenever the sky first starts to show a bit of brightness and you'll find Venus and it'll still be visible even as the sky gets really bright, bright enough for you to sort of move around without bumping into things. And when it's seen, in the morning. It's obviously called the morning star. When, it was, when we saw it in the evening, uh, up until about a few weeks ago, it was the evening star. It's the same object just appearing on different sides of the sun according to its orbital motion. Uh, it doesn't look terribly spectacular in a telescope. You'll see the phase similar to the phases of the moon. You don't see any detail on it because it's totally covered in cloud, but it is just so brilliant and beautiful that if you're up early in the morning, you want to see it and you've never seen it or never seen Mercury, now it's a good time to spot them. So Venus, absolutely brilliant in the southeast morning twilight to the lower left, a brightish star-like object, slightly pinkish Mercury, hard to see because it's lower down and not as bright. And then uh, on the other side of the triangle to the lower right of Venus, you may just spot Mars, but Mars will be a lot brighter later on in the year. So that's to what's, what's to look for at the moment. It's fantastic. Venus, seeing the Venus phase is a real, get a chance to take kids and, and show them. Because um, it's one of those things that really hits home that it's a planet and not a star. Obviously, yeah. you're looking at stars and they're just point sources and twinkling away. But it is it is really interesting. You're saying as well about not being able to see much on the surface. Obviously, there are amateurs even out there who are using you know specialized filters, infrared filters, calcium mm -hmm. K line filters, UV filters, who are picking up details not only on the cloud decks of Venus uh, with some of the cameras. And you've got to spend a few thousand pounds to really start seeing images like this. Um, but as I said, amateurs are doing this all the time, seeing you know cloud decks, cloud rotation, but also using infrared filters being able to see the surface of venus 
um, through effectively the heat emissions coming off mm -hmm. the surface using specialized infrared filters. Um, it's something I got into uh, a number of years ago when I was you know, doing a lot more planetary observation rather than just you know, galaxies and comets, etc. And it is really fascinating. Also, going back to the active region, um, if you go to like earthsky.org, it will also give you not only uh, images of the sunspot, and these sunspots in, in this AR2936 are literally bigger than the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite a significant one as terry was saying we've had a really prolonged minima where almost no sun so this is great looking at it even in white light it's spectacular looking at the sunspots now just on some of the images they are larger than the, the size of the earth if you look at that again with specialist telescopes using calcium k line hydrogen alpha etc you're going to see something really quite spectacular on the surface of the sun facing this way and it also let off an m-class solar flare so you can then do things like auroral predictions and some of the oral predictions for you know northern reaches of Canada, etc., are up in the high you know, 10s, 20s, 30 percent of uh, potential for aurora. And again, there's cameras all over the world. Uh, there's one group called Explore.org who do live cameras pointing up at the sky over the northern reaches of Canada. So even if you don't, don't live in the far northern regions and you want to see the aurora, there's some fantastic internet resources out there. So it's a great safe way of looking at our nearest stars, Terry is saying, but also finding out a lot more about what's happening up there. So um, that's pretty much us uh, for for this two weeks. Um, next week, I'll try and make sure that my Ethernet cable is plugged in or that North Korea aren't listening in. Uh, <laughs> apologies for the slight dropout before. Uh, and huge thank you as ever to store team and Terry for taking over. Um, and kind of keeping it all rolling when we have uh, these occasional little dropouts. Anyone who's been following Zoom uh, for the last few years, you know, I, I listen to Radio 4 most mornings and they lose government ministers, they lose really high profile people. So uh, to be able to stream live video uh, from both Northern Ireland, where Terry's based, and in the west of England, and then, you know, our teams up in Scotland and all around the UK uh, support us and behind the scenes it is amazing. Um, Massive hat tip as ever to Space Store for everything they do. Um, now that a lot of the restrictions, especially in the UK, have been lifted, um, please visit the Space Store um, based near Digcot in Oxfordshire, right near the Harwell Centre. So you might even bump into Prince Charles. Um, it's a great place, and they've been doing. They've been tweeting some fantastic stuff that we've been doing with outreach, especially with kids. Um, keep looking up, as we as we always say. I'll hand you back to our fantastic host, uh, Latch. Yep. Great. Thank you so much for another wonderful show. And thanks, uh, Terry, for dealing with that minor technical hitch we had. I was going to say, uh, Nick, you're pretty high profile for us here on this show, so <laughs> we couldn't do without you. No, no, no. Yeah. no it's, yeah. it's a great, it's a team effort, and yeah, it's just wonderful to be part of it. And, yeah, you yeah. guys in the background there, you yeah. do a lot of work too. We appreciate that. Yeah, we genuinely do. So fabulous. Keep it up. Great. And another big thank you to every one of you who's tuned in tonight. Thanks a lot if you're watching this on Catch Up. And I will end off tonight's show with saying if you are not subscribed to our mailing list, go ahead and do so. Go ahead to our website, scroll down to the bottom, add your email there, and you'll receive um, a bunch of different offers, surprises, um, and gifts, gift voucher codes um, to use on our website, install and online. Um, and yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're based around Didcot, come and give us a visit. We've recently just changed our install layout. Um, it's a lot more exciting. Uh, we've changed where our experience zone was. So come and have a look if you haven't already. Um, and uh, our team will be happy to um, put you into a VR, uh, put you into a spacesuit, and um, of course, uh, make sure you visit the Space Cafe. They do great coffee and great meteorites. <laughs> so definitely worth. And again, just looking at some of the viewers, I mean, it's great. We've got people as far away as Kenya. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for anyone who's tuning in, even watching upon on YouTube yep. uh, on Catch Up. So thanks again. Okay. Awesome. Cheers, everybody. Right, see you in two weeks. Guys. Have a good evening. We'll see you in a Bye. couple of weeks. Cheers, all. Bye. Bye.
there's only been about 20 or so recorded falls in British history. So to get one at all is quite rare. To get one that's witnessed is incredibly rare and then recovered. I mean, this is off the scale rare. It makes it even more interesting in that the meteorite is what's called a carbonaceous chondrite. So these are some of the most primitive materials in the entire universe. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Howes, space enthusiast, author, writer, broadcaster. Hi, I'm Terry Mosley, past president of the Irish Astronomical Association, lifelong astronomy and space nerd, absolutely fascinated by everything both man-made and natural up there. So every two weeks, Terry and I give you the latest, hottest news from space and uh, human spaceflight, robotic spaceflight, and what's happening up in the skies. Um, please tune in to us every fortnight uh, with the space stuff. Hi, 